Next, from the state capitol, we speak with Representative Patty Bellock about the effort to expand the state's Medicaid roles as part of the president's health care law. We hear how the state may add between 150,000 and 500,000 new recipients to Medicaid, the health care plan that covers the poor. This runs about 15 minutes. Representative Patty Bellock, thanks for joining us again on the Oni Channel. And uh, of the issues that are moving their way through the legislature, one of the primary ones that would have long-term repercussions for the state is the expansion uh, of Medicaid uh, uh, in the, uh, as, as I understand, part of Obamacare. Uh, that Senate Bill 26, uh, give us an overview, if you might, of your understanding of the issue and what it would mean for the state. Absolutely. Well, the um, issue is the expansion of Medicaid within the state, and this follows the Obamacare throughout the rest of the United States. It's probably the largest expansion of health care that's ever been done in the United States and would be in the state of Illinois if this bill passes. So what the bill does is there's actually five components of this bill now, but the major issue uh, in front of us that's been talked about for the last eight months is the expansion of Medicaid. And what this would do is we have 2.7 million people on Medicaid right now. Um, our concerns about this bill is the uncertainty of the number of people that will go on this Medicaid expansion. Right now, the department is talking about 350,000 people. Our concern is that the Kaiser Foundation, which is nationally known, has said it would be more like 500,000 in the new population that we be met at a 100% match. But then there's also what they call the woodwork population, which would probably be another 180,000 people. So our concern is the uncertainty, number one, of those numbers. Is it 350? Is it 500? Is it 800,000 people? that will be going on to Medicaid in Illinois. The next concern that we have is after the three years of the 100% match, it ratchets down to and 90. Let me interject. Sure. Some people have said, well, what about the cost of the state? Yes. And, and uh, some supporters of the bill have said, well, the federal government's going to pick up 100% for so many years, and then it's going to go down to, I believe, they'll be compensating about 90%. Yeah, so yeah. I just wanted, so, yeah. so you were then saying after three years, I just wanted to lay that as a foundation. I'm glad you did. <laughs> Thank you. So after that first three years, it does ratchet down. But what we're concerned about is the federal fiscal policy right now because we haven't had the debt ceiling talks. They've been pushed off to September. And several major financial people in the United States feel that in those debt ceiling talks, those w blended rates will change and that it will be a 65% rate rather than a 90% rate. So those are critical issues that are our concerns on the financial ability of our state to pay because, again, the Kaiser Foundation has said over the next three years, if you go with the 100% rate, it will still cost the state of Illinois around $1.5 billion. If that rate changes in the next two years after that, it could possibly cost the state of Illinois $6.5 billion, which would be unbelievable in a state that's on such bad financial footing currently. Uh, well, not to put words in your mouth, but some might say that it would be catastrophic, given that we are ready. What is the number? You would probably have a better idea of unpaid medical bills uh, providers now somewhere in the area of eight billion to nine billion dollars in past due. Yes, as of about two months ago, we had nine billion dollars of unpaid bills. We've been lucky that in April we had this blip up because of again the the fiscal cliff bill that we had to do the taxes. So that's a one-time revenue of which we've been enabled to pay down a lot of bills, but we can't count that into what is moving forward next year. So we'll probably be back up at at least six billion dollars of unpaid bills. And our bond rating has uh, been affected by that. So that's why we're trying to be very cautious with this uncertainty moving forward. I have asked that they put this vote off for several months till the fall, till veto session, till we see what's happening in the federal government and if these options have changed. President Obama, a year and a half ago, did have a blended rate in there, and then he took that out. But there have been other changes that have been made over the last couple of months to the Affordable Care Act, and we're just worried that these changes will take place. And once that population is on, we feel that that is a mandatory population. 
in the bill there is a trigger, but I don't think that that is accurate, and we need and to you know. explain what a trigger is. They have a trigger that to address our concerns that if there would be a change in the rate after three years, that five hundred thousand or three hundred thousand would automatically come off. Well, number one, I don't think the legislature would ever vote to take health care away from five hundred thousand people, but two. According to a lot of lawyers in Washington and a lot of articles that have been written, including the Wall Street Journal, they have said that in the Supreme Court decision allowing this opt-out for the states, it does not allow them, once those people are on the rolls, to take them off. So that will be a legal matter. What, uh, what about the, uh, the other idea that uh, because the House of Representatives at the federal level is controlled by the Republicans, uh, that that they are just not going to fund the implementation of Obamacare and while the law is on the books it may never actually be implemented. Well that's another issue and that's a federal issue and we in the state have no control over that so again that's another uncertainty so that's why there is no deadline as to when you can join into the Medicaid expansion. The clock starts ticking in January of 2014 but you can join in anytime you want after that it's just you wouldn't be able to get savings but it would still be much more certain as to what your rates were going to be in the next five years. As a budgeteer for our caucus and for this state, I feel it's important that we look not just at three years, but at a five-year, seven-year plan to actually get our state on a better fiscal footing. Uh, I don't know where this stands right now, but Julie Hamos, who runs the department that would handle the expansion of Medicaid, she had testified over a year ago that she's using 30-year-old computers. and. As a part of that, you have this concern that any number of people, again, Medicaid is health care for the indigent, uh, that you have non-citizens, people, even if they're citizens of uh, the United States coming, who are not citizens of Illinois, using Illinois hospitals, and uh, then those hospitals aren't being compensated. You can't track people or make sure that people are eligible when you have 30-year-old computers. Is anything being done to address the worn out technology that H uh, her department has. Oh, absolutely. In fact, as part, part of the Affordable Care Act, they are going to get a new computer system. So that's one really good thing. Something else that we have done in the SMART Act is that, and I want to make it clear that I am in support of Medicaid as serving the um, population that is so um, low income and needs this that we want to protect that population and give them good access and good quality health care. So that's part of the whole reason why we're doing these changes in Illinois. But we did do, in the SMART Act, we did hire an outside vendor to scrub the rolls on the Medicaid to find people who were abusing the system. And in the first batch that have come, we've waited seven months for these returns, they have found that 65% of the people were ineligible. So that backs up what we have been saying, that we need to take those people off the rolls so that we have more money in the system to provide the health care for this very, very important population. Uh, that's a, a startling statistic, yes, and I know right. I've seen a report. Uh, it, will those people actually be removed from yes, the rolls? they are being removed. Um, I have been told by the Department of Human Service, which is under Michelle Sadler, that those people are starting to be removed right now. And that is where we were supposed to get some of the $150 million savings in the SMART Act last year to put more back into the system to help with the health care. Okay. Um, before we close out, uh, let's just give a wrap up. What, what, where do we stand? Do you, do you anticipate that this might be done before the end of May, or do you think this is something that you would like to see put off and maybe addressed either in a special session or in the veto session in the fall? Well, being that I'm in the minority, <laughs> I don't control the call of the vote, and I think this vote is going to be called tomorrow. And so it's probably one of the most historic votes that will ever be taken in the chamber, and I hope that people will give serious consideration. And now it's more of a problem because some of the other issues that have been put into the bill are extremely important issues, some of which a lot of my members, and including myself, would like to support, but because this huge expansion issue is involved in the bill, it will be difficult to support some of other issues, such as managed care, care coordination for hospitals, and um, uh, nursing home reform. Just in general, and I know we could talk an hour on right. this, and I don't want to take too much of your time, what are just some of the other 
key components. We just aired something on nursing home reform, and people were saying, the operators were saying, because some of their things like dental care, and so then they have residents uh, who aren't getting uh, dentures anymore covered. And by, but a different department of the government that regulates uh, nursing homes is holding the nursing home operators accountable for their health. So they're saying the operators of nursing homes that we're caught betwixt and between. All right. There's several different components of the bill. One of them is the rugs issue, which I've been a huge supporter of. And what that does is it helps to address the um, assessments of people in nursing homes based upon acuity. So finally, a lot of the major nursing home groups have come together and resolved their issues and moved forward on this issue. It was supposed to have been implemented January 1st. They have agreed that they will do uh, pretty much of a full implementation by uh, 2015, which is um, very promising in the world of the nursing home issue. Uh, managed care, uh, care coordination is an extremely important issue, to the, especially to the hospitals. They have solved their issue, and that is in the bill also. And what that does is uh, bring into play into hospitals a new type of um, managed type care by hospitals and health providers called ACEs, and they're looking forward to that very much. It also um, is 50% going into regular managed care. So that's an extremely important issue, and that has been put in there. There is another issue regarding IMDs, which are nursing homes that served 51% of mentally ill. They are going to be called a new issue. They're going. There's a new act referring to them called the Smurf Act, and that's a very controversial issue amongst the mental health community. So you have five major, major issues. And then the trailer bill to the SMART Act, which you were talking about. One issue in that that I'm very much in support of is taking off the cap for the families that have medically fragile children. It's in there. There's another exemption for epilepsy drugs under the four script um, category that they have. So there's about eight changes to the SMART Act that a lot of people have wanted also. It, it, it somewhat puts into context what you were just saying, uh, going back to taking the people off the rolls that shouldn't be getting, don't really qualify. Uh, some people might say you're being cruel, but it goes to show that when you're spending money on those who aren't, shouldn't be part of the program, right. that you, you, it's really coming out of the care for those people that should qualify for it. Absolutely. If we could save $150 million just in that one category, we will put that money back into the health care for this very fragile population. And we will also pay our providers because a lot of our smaller providers are going out of business because the state has been so late up to six and nine months in paying those providers. And you cannot ask them to keep taking out loans to their bank and staying in business when the state is so far behind. So it's a cycle, and we need to correct that cycle. We need to provide a medical home for people in the program. We need to provide good quality care, good access to care, but at, and at the same time pay their providers. And by reforming the system, of which it's a bipartisan movement to do that, I think that we are finally on the right road to serving the population that we want to, but to also um, be fiscally responsible in doing so and provide better care. Representative Patty Bellick, thank you so much. Thank you. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 